there is a narrative in the Bible of paleo contact mm -hmm. that talks about the arrival of sky armies yeah. on Saber Hashemayim. It gives the names of some of the key figures. And then we're also told in the books of Jeremiah and 2 Kings that primitive Judaism was a canon of memory relating to that contact. Mm. They all had these big egos, they meaning these gods with a lowercase g. They were all kind of relatives of one another. Yeah. These advanced beings that showed up and engaged mankind according to the ancient text. And so they all began to go to war with one another and they all wanted to gather control yeah. over the people and over the resources. This plethora of powerful beings, the Elohim, who are competing with mm -hmm. each other. And unfortunately what's happened in the Bible is Elohim has been translated as God. Yeah. So all those wars become holy wars. Mm -hmm. What Jesus is actually saying is go beyond the mind mm -hmm. because all the powers and principles of the cosmos are available to you. Now that's powerful. Now that's, that's powerful. Power. And that's an invitation to explore what's possible for all of us. Yes. In another text, you can go to the, uh, the Gospel of Thomas uh, or to the Gospel of Matthew. Mm -hmm. And you've got the phrase, the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. is within you. Yeah. So that's the whole cosmic realm is inside you. That yeah. means if you look deeply inside yourself, yeah. you'll discover the cosmos. And if you look deep into the cosmos, you'll discover yourself. Exactly. Like my well, fractals. Now. You were talking about a fractal universe. Yeah. You're talking about quantum phenomena. If ever I use the word God, I always have to clarify what I mean. Yeah. And I love the way the Apostle Paul did that mm -hmm. in Acts 17. He's got a great definition of God, which is not a puppet master. Mm -hmm. It's not a king to be obeyed. Mm -hmm. He says, by God, and the Greek word is theos. Mm -hmm. By God, I mean the source of the cosmos mm. and everything in it. Mm. that in which we all live and move and have our being, of which we are all offspring. Hey everyone, it's Billy Carson, AKA Forbidden Knowledge. I'm here with best-selling author, Paul Wallace. He's a four times best-selling author. You gotta read the new book, The Eden Conspiracy, and there's many other books of this series. Also, he's the host of fifthkind.tv. That's 5th, fifthkind.tv. And of course, the Fifth Kind YouTube channel, almost 1 million subscribers, a testament to his ultimate success. Also, make sure you visit Paul Wallace channel on YouTube. You can go to the Paul Wallace channel on YouTube. And of course, you can go visit him at paulanthonywallace.com and go there and check everything he has out on that YouTube, on, on that uh, website. All right. So this is our second day really filming again. Thank you and welcome yeah, back good again. Good to be with you, Billy. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Paul is all the way from Australia. All right. So he took a long walkabout to get here. <laughs> I did. I think I'm finally in your time zone, Billy, today. Yeah. Yeah. You look a lot better. <laughs> I'm feeling a lot more human. I actually yeah. got some sleep last night. That's so. good. That's good. I know that the other day when we had a podcast, we touched on a lot of incredible topics. We really went into uh, some of the, I call them myths about the Old Testament and brought a little bit of light to them because I think that there's truth there but it's mixed with some incorrect information or maybe some incorrect perceptions about what happened in the past. Yes. And you help bring a lot of light to that as well. And so today, do you want to kind of guide us into where you want to go with, with this talk today? For sure. Well, uh, we can start there because uh, I get a lot of people reacting to mm -hmm. material I'm putting out saying, yeah. oh, Paul, you're trying to debunk the Bible here. Mm -hmm. uh, my agenda isn't that at all. I believe the Bible is full of accurate information mm -hmm. that we've often misinterpreted, mistranslated, and we miss things that we're told openly in the Bible 
because preachers tend to focus on the other stuff. Yeah. So I'll give you a for instance, which is really at the heart of things. There is a narrative in the Bible of paleo contact mm -hmm. that talks about the arrival of sky armies, yeah. Saber Hashemayim. It gives the names of some of the key figures. And then we're also told in the books of Jeremiah and 2 Kings that primitive Judaism was a canon of memory relating to that contact. Mm. And so they would have installations, they'd build standing stones at the places where they met these advanced beings. Mm -hmm. They would have temples where they'd have Thanksgiving ceremonies to thank them for their help in the Great Leap Forward, taking us from animal subsistence to teaching us how to farm and build mm -hmm. cities. And all that was primitive Judaism. Mm. And then you get to Jeremiah and Second Kings and the writers tell you, this is what the people were doing. Uh, in every, from every garrison city, every fortified town, on every high hill, under every green tree, installations to all these other beings. And then a king comes mm. along who decides he doesn't want any more of that. Yep. He wants everyone to worship the God he worships, mm -hmm. this Yahweh character. So that's by King Hezekiah. Mm -hmm. He decides to disinstall the standing stones. Mm break the other altars, mm -hmm. get rid of the other priesthoods. So there's now only one king, him, mm -hmm. his high priest, Hilkiah, yeah. his temple, all the ties of the nation coming there. And we would just forget all these other entities that everybody knew about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning of a process where Jewish ritual was changed. Mm -hmm. So it all became Yahwistic mm -hmm. ritual. And it was the beginning of a two phase reformation of Judaism, mm -hmm. starting with the ritual, and then starting with the story mm. and it takes us through the change in the Bible yeah. so that the Bible stops being about pay your contact and starts being about worship, obedience, paying your tithes, yeah. doing what you're told. The Bible tells us there was that shift, mm -hmm. that the story was changed yeah. and yet people miss it mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. But the main thing is that we just don't give attention to those bits. Exactly. We give attention to all the other bits. Yeah. And well, the people that are preaching from the pulpit typically are focusing on the other parts that you just talked about, because the, the part that it got pivoted to, because, of course, that brings in finances for them. It keeps the people under a certain level of control as well. Exactly. So if you've got a God who is portrayed as someone to be obeyed, mm -hmm. if you've got a religion that is based on one that's all about giving God his dues, which means money mm -hmm. and the best of all your everything that you earn. Your first and best well, harvest. Very, very easy to manipulate that, isn't it? Oh, really? And if you've got texts that say that things aren't going to go well for you if you don't do those things, bingo, that mm -hmm. preaches well. Yeah. And unfortunately, in a lot of churches, preachers get led by what preaches well mm -hmm. instead of thinking, wait a minute, what, what did that text just say? Mm -hmm. The people loved Asherah and hated Yahweh. Mm -hmm. We should get into that, shouldn't we? Yeah. Well, chances are, if he did get into that, his board would gather around him and say, Pastor, we don't want another sermon like that. So mm -hmm. it's all a bit of a conspiracy mm -hmm. to keep the old story going because it banks well and it preaches well. Yes. Rather than because it's getting to the truth of what's in the Bible. Exactly. And let me see your book. There you go. I'm going to show it to everyone here. It's The Eden Conspiracy. Paul Wallace, make sure you get this book immediately and make sure you get his book series it's a four part book, book series a fifth one coming very soon um and just to give you a little bit of before we get too much deeper for the ones who are just listening to you for the first time give them a little bit of history about your background in the church yeah my background it surprises a lot of people that uh, as a paleo contact guy my background is in ministry mm -hmm. so 33 years in church-based ministry and i worked as a uh, church doctor a theological educator, training pastors, mm -hmm. and in particular, I trained them in the history of Christian thought and hermeneutics, mm -hmm. which is the principles of interpreting ancient texts. And I was an archdeacon for the Anglican Church in Australia, so that's one down from a bishop, so right. it's quite a senior role. Mm -hmm. So it surprises people that someone from that background is now saying, hey everyone, I think the Bible's got a heap of aliens in it, and there's a whole other bunch of stories in it, <laughs> that is really equipping us for people power in the yeah. present day. Mm -hmm. People miss those things, right. but that is how I got to it. Interesting. And so I just wanted to let the people know that we're, we're, you know, we're listening to a person that has been in the church for 33 years or was in a church for 33 years. 
and literally you're talking to a reverend here, or you're listening to a reverend. So you're talking to somebody well versed in theology uh, and theology. So um, now back to what we were talking about. So in the Old Testament, there's a correlation that's similar to the story you just told, but also to uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten. And Pharaoh Akhenaten wanted to also help usher in this monotheistic uh, ah, concept or yes. idea of this one God religion, where he actually began to uh, worship Aten, the sun disk, or AKA Amen Ra. Amen. <laughs> and, but he, he then was uh, telling everyone to go around and begin to deface all the other gods for this other entity. And so again, everyone was going crazy. They were like, this guy's erasing our history from all the hieroglyphs. And then they wanted to oust him out of there. Yes. So we kind of see this similar thing. These gods uh, with a lowercase g, by the way, they tend to get um, jealous and, and, uh, of each other. And they also say that in the Bible, I'm a jealous God. Yes, right? that's Which right. lets you know that that God is not the creator of the universe. It's more than likely a person you know, of some type of some type of a sentient being, uh, but not the creator of the universe. Uh, and what's interesting about it, though, is the fact that he's ousted. They go to to get him out of there. And then, of course, you know, King Tut comes in behind him, uh, which is his son. He's killed pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so there's this this thing going on where but you see this. All these gods or these people, they all want to be the one. Yes, that's right. It, that's an interesting story because it's almost a mirror image mm -hmm. of the story I just told from the Bible. Yeah. Because when Akhenaten is saying, uh, let's worship the one God, mm -hmm. what he was doing was disempowering these powerful political groups, which were the priesthoods. Yeah. If all of a sudden you're saying you can have some kind of a direct relationship uh -huh. with the divine source of the cosmos, <laughs> yeah. well, what do you need, need these little priesthoods for? Mm -hmm. And this is what sometimes confuses people in the Bible because the great redaction, that change of the story, mm -hmm. one layer of it was actually quite empowering. Mm. And it was the monotheistic layer that says, there's only one God and source of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Why bother with anything less than that? That's a very positive message. It's a very yeah. empowering message. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that all gets mixed in with the suppression of indigenous knowledge in the Bible. Yes. So it can be very complicated, mm -hmm. but you can see in the Akhenaten story, you cannot separate religion from politics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> if you found. do, whoop, off with the head. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. They all had these big egos, they meaning these gods with a lowercase g. They were all kind of relatives of one another. Yeah these advanced beings that showed up and engaged mankind according to the ancient text, not according to us. We're just interpreting what's already been written, right? Um, and so they all began to go to war with one another and they all wanted to gather control yeah. over the people and over the resources. Yes. Battle yes. for resources. And over each other. Yeah. I mean, who was going to be the top god, mm -hmm. you know, the top powerful one? Yeah. But I think they went to war for very similar reasons that we go to war with each other. Mm -hmm. It is they want control of the environment mm -hmm. and they want to benefit from the resources. Right. And the human beings, unfortunately, get drawn into this. So you can't really understand the stories of Yahweh in the Bible mm -hmm. until you realize that that's the picture, that you've got this plethora of powerful beings, the Elohim, who are competing with mm -hmm. each other. And unfortunately, what's happened in the Bible is Elohim has been translated as God. Yeah. So all those wars become holy wars, mm -hmm. and you then have to start agreeing with the one side, the Yahweh side, yeah. and to agree with him, you've got to agree with warfare, you've got to agree with scorched earth, mm -hmm. infanticide, yeah. genocide. Right. And how on earth do you square that with having a clear conscience? Yeah. Well, essentially, Christianity says, forget your conscience, mm -hmm. <laughs> just do what you're told. Do what you're told. And That's agree it. with everything Yahweh does. Don't, don't question God. Don't question God. Yeah. But really, the, the freedom is the moment you realize that Jesus was on about something completely different, mm -hmm. you can then go back to the old stories and start evaluating the behavior of the characters. Yeah. If there's a genocide, call it that. Mm -hmm. If there's infanticide, call it that. Mm -hmm. If there's something abusive happening, 
call it that. Yeah. It leads nowhere good if you see something awful and then think you have to disregard it or call it holy. Yeah, exactly. And so many people over many, many eons have taken and interpreted that script, uh, that text in a way that they justify murder, killing, abuse of rights, suppression, oppression, um, and of course, uh, making themselves very, very wealthy by subjugating the people and taxing them and taking their food and everything else. And so we, you know, it's, <laughs> this thing is mind blowing because the, d the deeper you dig into it and the more you read it and research it, the more you realize there's a lot of manipulation that has gone on for so long. It's almost now embedded and encoded in our DNA. It's no wonder why the majority of people fall right into this as soon as they're born. You know, they're kind of, for it's kind of forced on them. Like I said, you're given yeah. a name, a race and a religion and you spend the rest of your life defending a false identity. Yeah, that's right. And unfortunately, a lot of this thinking is is built into how we read the words mm -hmm. because of bad translation choices. Yeah. So by the time you get to the gospel, you, you're looking at a Bible that looks like it's made up of two parts, Old mm -hmm. Testament and New Testament. You assume it's the same God from start to finish that yeah. it's talking about, which it is not. Mm -hmm. And you get to the beginning of the gospel and you reach a phrase like this. Here's Jesus's first sermon that he toured with for 12 months, mm -hmm. according to the Gospel of Matthew. We read the words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mm -hmm. And you hear those words and you think, oh, I know what they mean. Mm -hmm. Repent. Well, I've obviously been very naughty and I need to stop being naughty yeah. for the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. God's about to show up and you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him. <laughs> right. That's what it sounds like. It's scary. You go to the root meanings of those words. Mm -hmm. and what Jesus is actually saying is go beyond the mind mm -hmm. because all the powers and principles of the cosmos are available to you. Now that's powerful. Now that's, that's powerful, empowering. and that's an invitation to explore what's possible for all of us. Yes. In another text, you can go to the uh, the Gospel of Thomas uh, or to the Gospel of Matthew, mm -hmm. and you've got the phrase, the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. is within you. Yeah. So that's the whole cosmic realm is inside you. That mm -hmm. means if you look deeply inside yourself, yeah. you'll discover the cosmos. And if you look deep into the cosmos, you'll discover yourself. Exactly. There couldn't be a bigger invitation to explore than that. That's what Jesus is on about, mm -hmm. and we distort it and lose it with these bad translation choices. Yeah. Kingdom, well, that's all about obeying a king, isn't mm -hmm. it? Repent, that's about saying sorry for offending the king. Mm -hmm. And we turn it into a religion that makes us tiptoe around for fear we're going to offend the Almighty, yeah. when in fact Jesus is wanting to empower us and uplift us and show us what's possible for humanity. Exactly. Now, what's interesting is when you begin to look at some of the references to God in the Bible and some of the original texts, when I was researching this about maybe eight, nine years ago, I saw that some of the word God, some of the places where it says God, it's actually God's, but the S is missing. Yeah. It's also this monotheistic uh, concept to usher in this one God thing. Like you say, Elohim, that's plural. Yeah. That's not singular, but they don't teach it that way. No, they don't. So Elohim, uh, you go to the root meaning, it's the powerful ones. Mm -hmm. And then El Elion gets translated as God or the highest. Mm -hmm. And you think you're reading about God. It doesn't mean that. It means the powerful one, more powerful than the others. Mm -hmm. You read El Shaddai, often that's translated as the Almighty. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the New Jerusalem Bible, it will tell you squarely. Or if you go to the Brown Drivers Briggs Hebrew lexicon, that's mm. the most authoritative lexicon it is, mm. that will tell you that's a false translation. Mm. That's made up. It doesn't mean the Almighty. It means the powerful one, the destroyer, which is something completely different. Yeah. So if you're actually worshipping the destroyer, just do the math. That's Oof. not going to work out. <laughs> it's not going to work well. out the best for you. And then you've got the name Yahweh, which in some parts of the Bible is used to mean the God, the source of the cosmos. You go back to when Yahweh first shows up and you realize you're looking at a draconian entity, one of many Elohim who's now going to go to war with each other mm -hmm. for land and for resources. And if you and I get slaughtered in the process, it's yeah, too bad. Exactly. We're so just collateral damage. We're just collateral damage. Yeah. So all those entities, <laughs> they're not God. Right. And God is not in 
those early stories at all. We shouldn't be surprised because they're based on the Sumerian stories, which yes. are not God's stories either. Exactly. So I think Bible translators have a, a, a lot to answer for mm. in muddying the waters, making us think we're reading God's stories when we're actually reading stories about colonization, mm. uh, abuse, mm -hmm. hidden hands in human politics, covert government, yes. <laughs> invasion. Yes. And also there's a positive side to it as well, mm -hmm. because there are entities named who came for our benefit. Mm -hmm. So you come across Dagon, you come yeah. across Asherah. That's right. Here's a story of contact that's not invasion of the body snatchers, yeah. war of the world's <laughs> horror. It's beings who have come because they love humanity. They want to support our progress. Mm -hmm. And again, I think there was a desire to move away from those narratives mm -hmm. because it's simpler if you've got a narrative you can control. Yeah. You know, one emperor, mm -hmm. one god, yeah. one source of information. The ancients believed we all have potential contact experiences, yeah. that we have the attention of cosmic neighbors who want to help us as a species mm -hmm but also help us individually as yes, well. Right, exactly, enlightenment. Like Thoth the Atlantean, right? He, so he calls himself an Atlantean priest king, and he literally goes around the planet uh, teaching people, building techniques, alchemy, you know, from the land of chem, chemistry out of the land of chem, mm. and many other things. And he's been all over the world, and everywhere he shows up around the world, it appears that he's always teaching. Uh, you know, he could be possibly Wang Di, the first emperor of China who appeared uh, coming in on a flying dragon. And Australia, they call him Thoth the Mabi. He taught and worked with the aboriginals. Of course, you know, in Africa is Tahuti, Jahuti, Thoth, uh, into Mesoamerica, Quetzalcoatl, you know, Kukulkan. I mean, all these names is just like, but they, it's the same person that appears to be appearing all around the planet, but teaching wisdom, knowledge, understanding, building techniques and everything else. So like you said, there are some that are here too that came to uplift, help and assist. Thoth says for he, it's mankind's birthright to seek the light and to become the light. Yes, right? yes, that's right. Now, what's so fascinating about that tradition is that wherever that appears, you have an ascension tradition. Mm -hmm. You have people believing that through certain protocols and through seeking the truth, mm -hmm. they can not only have a better understanding of things, but they can become more powerful and have a better, yeah. more conscious experience as a human being. Yeah. Thoth is at the heart of wisdom traditions that we would call ascension traditions mm -hmm. all around the world. And what's interesting is that that weaves in through Christianity in a semi-covert way. Yes. It does. <laughs> so it sort of keeps, you You read something, you think, wait a minute, is that is that guy doing Bible study or is he telling me something else? Right. And then you get to the 1200s, mm -hmm. you reach the Cathars, and they were really the fruit of that tradition mm. rooted in Thoth mm -hmm. that existed within Christianity. Mm. And in the 1200s, there was a whole people group living in the Languedoc in the south of France mm. who had translated that philosophy into a corporate way of life. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just individuals seeking wisdom. They were transforming what human society looked like. Right. Now, Europe in the 1200s didn't look crash hot. No. Okay, people were sick, yeah. people were violent, oh, people were poor. Yeah. You went to the south of France, healthy, happy, wise, serene. Mm. And so, of course, the uh, Roman Catholic Church responded by genociding them. Of course. <laughs> because uh, here was a people group again who didn't depend on the power structures yeah they'd found a way to be healthier happier more conscious mm -hmm. and it was a threat to the powers that be who wanted to keep Europe feudal mm -hmm. again you know the king and right. god at the top everyone else paying and obeying exactly but they had followed all the wisdom you can trace back to Thoth, mm. and they had proved that it not only makes wiser individuals, it builds a better society. Exactly. And when you build a better society, you don't need uh, the kingpin at the top, like you say, right? No. And then also, there's no fear in their hearts. And when there's no fear, yeah. you can't mold them. Exactly. Yeah. And that was very specific about them. They did not fear hell, which was the church's teaching. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, the church said the whole of Languedoc are heretics. Yeah. So we get exactly. rid of them. Exactly. 
Do you know a little bit about the Papal Inquisitions, which over, I think over the course of 700 years, close to 80 million people were tortured and, and killed to bring this concept of, of, of Christianity that obviously had Rome at the top? Yes, well, it, I, it's a very dark topic that I haven't probed okay. <laughs> too deeply. It is dark. But uh, the Cathars are really at the beginning of that yeah. process because it's estimated that up to a million people were genocided yeah. over the course of 19 successive popes. Mm -hmm. And they really set the template. If you can do that in the name of God and get away with it right. and still be regarded as the Holy Father, well, mm -hmm. we'll employ that elsewhere. Yeah. And so when you get into the period of the Renaissance mm -hmm. and you've got other authorities and other information emerging, you get yeah. someone like Giordano Bruno who was not only talking about a populated universe, he was teaching people how to use their brains. Yeah. By that point, they've evolved the Inquisition to a point where you identify anyone with a following, anyone with information that's not going to help us, mm -hmm. and then you put them on trial, you prove them guilty of various heresies, yeah. and then you execute them in the most violent way possible. For public to see. For the public to see, to send out that signal, you do not think for yourself, mm -hmm. you do not repeat these ideas, yeah. you believe what we tell you. Exactly. I mean, that's as recent as 1600. That's yeah. post the Renaissance, mm -hmm. and that was still going on because they were fighting for control. And it's a pattern, I think, in human governance that when authorities feel their power is slipping, mm -hmm. that's when they get the most violent. Exactly. And I would say look up the the killing of Giordano Bruno and that's yeah. an example of exactly that pattern. Oh, for sure, no doubt. A lot of, you know, unfortunately a lot of indigenous people suffered that fate where they would go to a, a village, take the uh, chief or take, you know, whoever was the head man or woman in charge, string them up right in front of everybody and just torture them to death and allow everybody, you speak our language, you follow this religion or this will happen to you. Exactly. And that was really the process of a colonization in Central and South America, mm -hmm. where the priests were gotten rid of mm -hmm. and the kings and queens. Yeah. So they could now be governed by Catholic Portugal and Spain mm -hmm. and the Pope. Yeah. And so all those authorities were gotten rid of and their libraries were burned as well, mm -hmm. which was a pretty emphatic signal. There's only one narrative yeah. now. Forget everything you thought you knew. Mm -hmm. We're going to tell you the truth. Yeah. Your priesthood has now been replaced. Mm -hmm. Your schools have now been replaced. Yeah. And you're all going to be Orthodox Christians. Yeah. And it happens really whenever an empire takes somebody else's country. They just want to control the narrative. Mm -hmm. I say just want, but that's, yeah. that's, what, that's it what it amounts to. It amounts what it, literally what it is. to cultural genocide. Yeah, yeah, it is. Wow. And this has gone on for so long. You know, one big a uh, book heist, I believe, happened, the Library of Alexandria. I yes. don't believe that all the books burned. I believe the books, some books burned, but there was a distraction for a book heist, probably the largest heist of knowledge in mm -hmm. history. Well, that makes a lot of sense, and it's always been a mystery as to exactly how the entire library I, <laughs> could disappear. Yeah, I know. And I think all sorts of false stories were put forward yeah. because anyone with a brain would know the value of what was there and some yeah. of the knowledge that was lost it took us best part of a thousand fifteen hundred years to recover yeah. that level of understanding so there were volumes in there that had calculated the mass of the planet mm -hmm. and the size of the planet how yeah. many centuries did it take before we recovered that information Crazy. And we've been able to piece together some of what was there mm -hmm. because of quotations in other works. Yeah. But it really was an attempt to take the sum of human knowledge back down to zero. Right. So that an authority can now tell you what's what mm -hmm. once again. And exactly. there's no alternative narrative to choose. Right. Do you think possibly, and it's, you know, you know honest answer, I mean, you always give an honest answer anyway, but behind the scenes, when things like this happen, like, you know, this this whole Library of Alexandria and all these other pushes to indoctrinate people worldwide, do you think from behind the scenes that some of these beings could be pulling the strings uh, in this current era? Um, it's possible, but I think it's easy to explain at a purely human level. Mm. So if you look at, for instance, when Yahwism mm -hmm. took over Judaism, yeah. 
I don't think necessarily Yahweh was pulling those strings. Okay. I think the king who was a Yahwist mm -hmm. and the high priest who was a Yahwist, they were pulling the strings. I'm not sure Yahweh himself was on the scene in mm -hmm. that moment. Yeah. He may have been. And I'm certainly open to that thought because right. these taught, things... It's, taught, it's a taught technique of taking power and control. Exactly. So I think we've seen it done. It's a template. We mm -hmm. repeat it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It's interesting. It's almost like we're an abandoned seed colony now on this planet. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and we're just spending well, for ourselves. Yes, but I do think there is an active non-human layer to the story. Yeah. So I would go to the work of Robert Kirk, mm -hmm. writing in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. Now, he's not the kind of guy you'd expect to start spouting paleo contact mm -hmm. because he was a Presbyterian minister in the mm -hmm. 1600s. So that's conservative on about three counts. Oh, yeah. But what he did was listen to the indigenous narratives mm -hmm. of the Celtic people mm. of Aberfoyle in Scotland. And he started hearing abduction narratives. Wow. And he joined the dots. He wrote a book called mm. the, uh, the Secret Commonwealth. And what he said in that book is that no understanding of the world is complete. Mm -hmm. until you realize there is a non-human layer to our governance, mm. that you have visible government, then you've got covert government. Gotcha. You've got the elites pulling the strings on the covert government, mm -hmm. and then you've got non-human entities in communication with the elites. I believe that 1,000%. Now, if that was true in the 1600s, you can bet your bottom dollar it's yeah. true today. You can find the same pattern in the Bible, as I show in the Eden Conspiracy, yeah. and you can find it all around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is behind the scenes, behind the veil manipulation that continues on an ongoing basis. It's really amazing and a testament to human beings that we are right now where we are. As a species, I mean, technically, if you look at everything that's already happened on this planet, we shouldn't even be here. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's right. So much awful stuff oh, has man. been done to human beings through yeah. the ages. And we were saying the other day about the plagues. Do you mm -hmm. remember? I said, yeah. we, we are the descendants of those who survived the plagues. Yes. That's how strong we are. Yeah. We're stronger than our ancestors right. because we've actually survived and come we're through. We're the stronger ones. We are the, the we're bred to be strong because we are we survived the bubonic plague, the black plague, right? Exactly. Those two almost wiped everybody out. Just those two things alone. If it was going to be the end of days, that should have been the end of days at that That's moment. That's right. At the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu. Oh my that. goodness. Oh my. That was crazy. 20, many... 20 million people. Yes. At yeah. the beginning of the 20th century. Right. So there's a lot that's come against us. Mm -hmm. All kinds of political manipulations mm -hmm. to keep ordinary human beings super stressed, yeah. sick, so they can easily be managed. And yet, look at where we are. Yeah. Not only have we survived, mm -hmm. but we're getting wise yeah. to what the story is. And we're getting wise to how do you and I mm -hmm. thrive in this world? Exactly. You and I might not be able to dislodge the non-human layer yeah. or even the 1%, mm -hmm. but we can learn to be more conscious, yeah. more healthy, and to thrive mm -hmm. in this world even as it is. Exactly. And that itself becomes contagious. Yeah. Because people see it and we become the lighthouse. And they say, you know, I can do that too. And let me just listen to what they have to say and let me duplicate what they're doing. And all of a sudden, you, before you know it, more people are doing the same thing. More people are asking questions, more people are researching, more people are looking within. It's pretty interesting. One of the biggest topics that I've dug into, you know, in the last decade has been the Apocrypha text. Can you describe for the viewers what is Apocrypha text? Yes. Um, the Hebrew canon, what we call the Old Testament, evolved in several stages. So you start off with the stories of beginnings, the Abrahamic stories, and they were the summary form of the Sumerian narratives. Mm -hmm. And then they got added to as laws were brought in, uh, scriptures were written to justify the laws by which the people were governed. And then added to that was worship material that layered a religious gloss over all of that. And it evolved and it evolved. And it became known as the Hebrew Canon, which formed in the 6th century BCE, as we know it. At that time, all those scriptures were gathered together 
and they were rewritten mm -hmm. so that it looks like a seamless story of God from beginning to end. And that's when the name Yahweh was pasted over the whole thing yeah. to try and make it uniform. Mm -hmm. And then between that period and the time when Jesus shows up, more scriptures were being written. Mm -hmm. And there came a moment when it was decided by the leading party of scribes, we'll do another rewrite mm -hmm. and we'll write it in Greek now. <laughs> because there's such a demand for monotheism, we yeah. can market this religion because it had become a religion by this point yep. to the world. People want monotheism, we'll give them our monotheism. Mm -hmm. So they write it in Greek and they include some of these other books. And what's so interesting about these later books is that they are a bridge between the worldview of the Hebrew canon and international thought as it was at that time. Mm -hmm. And so you're beginning to get new ideas coming in wow. about what is the human soul? Mm -hmm. What is consciousness? Mm -hmm. Did we exist before we lived on this earth? Do we exist after we die? Mm -hmm. And what are these other beings that people are having contact with? These, yeah. these angelic experiences? What are, all those are now in these texts mm -hmm. and you can read them and you can hear the influence of international thought. Mm -hmm. When you get to Jesus, the people who wrote for Jesus, whenever they quote the um, Old Testament, as we'd call it, mm -hmm. they're quoting that Greek translation mm -hmm. with all the extra books in it as well. Yeah. And that became known as the Septuagint, yes. it's written as LXX. Mm -hmm. So you would think that would be the Bible everyone would be reading. Right. If Jesus quotes from it and his apostles quote from it, right. surely that's the one we all it's read. It's significant. It's significant. It was seen as authoritative, <laughs> except that you get some way into Christian history and the Jewish authorities say, mm -hmm. we don't like these Greek no, ideas. No, no, no. Let's pair this back to that simple Yahwism we mm -hmm. had before, that pyramid shape. Yeah. It's all about authority, obedience, worship. We like that better. Mm -hmm. So they pair it back to that. Yeah. And then Christianity does the same in its own history. It mm -hmm. pairs it back because ultimately yeah. It was now being run by an empire that wanted exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Emperor, God at the top, yep. bishops and landlords in the middle, mm -hmm. and then the people at the bottom just paying, praying and obeying. And so we lose those other books with all these other insights in them yes. about populated cosmos, yep. contact for you and me, mm -hmm. ascension traditions, yes. contact with other kinds of being. And so we lose what was really a very diverse education that was mm -hmm. on offer. Yeah. But you can still buy it. You can buy it. You can still you can buy get it and the, still read the it. The full Apocrypha. I have it here in my house. You can get the full Apocrypha instead of buying all the... I bought it initially with all the individual books years and years ago. Now you can buy one book with all the Apocrypha text that was kept out of. These are the omitted books of the Bible. You can buy them on Amazon. Uh, you can go to a Barnes & Noble store if you have one of those and go buy it at the bookstore or wherever. But you can get the Apocrypha text and you can read this for yourself. I was really impressed by the book of Adam and uh, just reading the the way he took the expulsion from the Garden of Eden um, and what he went through mentally and the trauma that he went through psychologically. Man, it was like gut-wrenching. Pretty interesting stuff. It's interesting you mention that because there are so many other layers mm -hmm. in these other sort of forbidden books. Yeah. And the same could be said of the books excluded from the New Testament, mm -hmm. the Gnostic texts. Yes. <laughs> where again, oh, you've got something that's so much more rounded in its yeah. understanding of the human condition, mm -hmm. the nature of the cosmos, yeah. the psychology of people. And I mean, I love the canonical gospels, mm -hmm. but we're missing so much if we don't read the, the Gnostic texts as well. Yeah. And not just the Gnostic texts, texts like the Gospel of Thomas, which mm -hmm. isn't Gnostic, it's probably the earliest yeah. testament to the teaching of Jesus that Absolutely. exists. And once we had uh, started recovering a lot of these texts with the Nag Hammadi finds, mm -hmm. we remembered mm -hmm. that in the beginning Christianity was a kaleidoscope of views, experiences, ideas, yeah. Yeah. theologies, before it got Mm -hmm. pared down to this, again, this worship and obedience picture. Right. And to make it clear to everyone, of course, uh, this man, uh, you're talking about a reverend here, sitting here talking to you about the plurality of worlds and uh, 
you know, extraterrestrial life existing and, and somehow engaging mankind. But we're not saying that we don't believe that God exists. I mean, clearly this man was in the church for many years. I believe that there's a God as well. I think that the quantum physics proves that we're living in a creation and that there's an entity that built this creation. And so I, I truthfully believe it deep down in my soul. Quantum is fascinating mm -hmm. because you remember what I was saying earlier about Jesus saying, the whole of the cosmic realm is inside you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're talking about <laughs> well, fractals. Now. You were talking about a fractal universe. Yeah. You're talking about quantum phenomena. Mm -hmm. And I, I find uh, quantum physics really exciting yeah. because it, from time to time, really has to reach for God language. Yes, it does. <laughs> to no, it does. Explain what's happening. For sure it does. Absolutely. And I think that a lot of quantum physicists can't argue the fact that they believe that there is a God because the fingerprint of the creator is on everything. Like yeah. literally, where no matter where you look, you see, if you were looking for the circumstantial evidence for of a crime scene of creation, and, yes. and you looked into the quantum realm, and then you looked even into the mathematical realm, pi, phi, uh, you know, and all of that, all of a sudden you discover, wow, there's a fingerprint left behind that is the fingerprint yeah. of the creator itself. Now, unfortunately, some people will hear that mm -hmm. and they'll be disturbed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because if you attach that to the word God, the word God will suddenly activate ideas of fear, mm -hmm. judgment, mm -hmm. hell. Yeah. I've got to get it right. I'm going to be in trouble if I get it wrong. And I, if ever I use the word God, I always have to clarify what I mean. Yeah. And I love the way the Apostle Paul did that mm -hmm. in Acts 17. He's got a great definition of God which is not a puppet master, mm -hmm. it's not a king to be obeyed. Mm -hmm. He says, by God, and the Greek word is theos, mm -hmm. by God I mean the source of the cosmos mm. and everything in it, mm. that in which we all live and move and have our being, of which we are all offspring. And what I love about that, there's no separation anxiety in that. Yeah. And I think most manipulative religion trades on separation anxiety. Yes. You know, you're going to hell, you're in trouble, you're not in good God's good books. Right. We'll show you how to claw your way back into his presence. Yeah. And it involves giving us money. Of, of course. course. you got to bring so, us your best and bring all the money with you too. Exactly. And all that, unfortunately, is associated with the word God mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Yeah. So, I mean, my wife, Ruth, doesn't use the word God. She mm. always talks about divine intelligence. I love Often it. I'll just talk about the source yeah. because that's what I mean by God. Yeah. And it might sound a little impersonal until you realize that for instance, what Paul is saying is that your mind is a participation in the divine mind. Correct. Your consciousness is an emanation of divine consciousness, mm -hmm. which means you can fully expect the most incredible divine things to happen. Yes. Simply because you are a fractalization exactly. of the divine source. We are all a part of the divine source. And, uh, you know, this divine energy that permeates and imbues everything in the entire universe has fractalized itself into Google's of entities, right? So that it can experience itself subjectively. And a fractal of what I just said, well, the proof of that is my body and your body is made up of what? Atoms. And so if you were to look in inside of an electron microscope at an atom, you're just a bunch of atoms observing itself, trying to figure out what it is. Yeah. See, so if you take it to that method or that, that, I, that conceptual idea, you'll see that everything is a fractal as above, so below, hermetic principles. That's right. And I, I love that. It took a bit of reframing for me because mm -hmm. I'd lived for so long with this puppet master image of God. Right. But then when I realized that I could be in a situation and I could say, God, what do you make of this? Mm -hmm. Knowing that God was observing the situation I was observing mm -hmm. because I was observing exactly. it. Exactly. He could observe it through my eyes. And if I would say, God, what do you make of this? There would be an answer. Mm -hmm. There would be wisdom. Yeah. And the way that's impacted my prayer life is I ask God questions mm. and I find I get answers super fast yeah. and the answers are mind blowing. Mm. Sometimes I'll say, team, can you help me with this? Mm -hmm. Because I found that God, the source of the cosmos, can express himself through Billy, mm -hmm. through that plant, through your beautiful dog, yeah. through a song coming on the radio. Yeah. It really is that kind of a universe mm -hmm. that God, the source, imbues everything. Yes. And so you couldn't be more intimately involved with mm -hmm. the divine life of the cosmos than you already are. It's a matter of waking up to that, mm -hmm. beginning to enjoy it, 
and follow that invitation of Jesus, knowing that the principles are available for you to start playing with mm -hmm. and exploring. Yeah. I hope you guys are listening to this incredible discussion that I'm having here with an actual reverend, uh, a man that has been in the church for 33 years and is now a four time best selling author. Make sure you get The Eden Conspiracy on Amazon and check out his other uh, three books to go along with it. And a fifth book is on the way soon. We're kind of running out of a little bit of time here, but man, how will we wrap this up? What is something you can tell the listeners uh, that would give, some, give them some inspiration? I think uh, something that a lot of us have learned through the last few years, we've had a lot of negativity broadcast to us. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that here on the TV here. There's yeah. so much anxiety. <laughs> <Always bad. laughs> Every commercial break. <laughs> And a lot of us have learned that we have to be intentional about our emotional state and our mm -hmm. state of mind. Mm -hmm. So before you step out of the bathroom, having brushed your teeth, before you step out of the front door to start engaging with other people, you decide what energy am I going to bring to others today? Mm -hmm. What do I want people to feel when they walk away from a conversation with me? Yeah. And I, most people, if they're intentional about it, they'll choose a high emotion. They'll mm -hmm. choose a high vibration. Yeah. And when you start giving that out to other people, mm -hmm. you get it back. Yeah. You smile at someone, they'll smile back. Right. You compliment someone, they'll compliment you back. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you're having a good day yeah. because you've made that decision. And I think if you're not intentional, then you'll just be manipulated by every signal you're getting off every magazine cover, mm -hmm. everything you hear on the radio, everything on the TV, mm -hmm. get intentional yeah. and you begin to alter your experience of life from mm -hmm. day to day. And I wow. found that to be a really powerful and elevating truth. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. Where can everyone find you? Go to fifthkind.tv. You can find me on YouTube on the Paul Wallace channel and the Fifth Kind. If you're interested in doing coaching, you can come to paulanthonywallace.com and go to Amazon and Kindle for the Eden series and the most recent one, the Eden Conspiracy, mm -hmm. covering much of what we discussed today yes. and many more things besides. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in behind the scenes. Thank you for tuning in. This is Forbidden Knowledge, Throw What I Love. Peace.